So we know, you know, there's other species that are making that those migrations, right? Wrapping around Florida, like cobia and a number of species and targeting, probably targeting this, you know, this very rich, um, productive area out of the, you know, out of the center of the Gulf of the Mississippi um, drainage. And there's no, this is, you know, this, these movements that we're detecting by jacks makes us think that jacks are also tapping into the productivity, right? There's so much prey and so much food in that area that um, it pays for certain species to have these migratory patterns that encompass that production there at the best, you know, most productive time of the time of the year. Mm -hmm. um, in the in the summer, you know, to try to capture that summer production because they're a much more annual system than we are, where we have productivity all year round or the lower productivity. But there, there, you know, summer production, you get all this recruitment and all these baby shrimp and baby fish that come out of those marshes, right? Um, and you're catching that productivity, and then that inshore offshore migration of the food. And there's no reason now to think that um, jacks are just going to tap into that productivity as well coming out of the Gulf. This is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Fascinating stories to amaze, encourage, and inspire you in fishing, fitness, and the outdoors. And we're brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. I started this podcast as a way to connect with my friends, people that I admire and respect, and you. It has been a learning journey that's made me a better person, a better fisherman, a better father, and a better athlete. I'm so happy that you're on this journey with me, and I'd love to hear from you with show suggestions, guest suggestions, or questions. The best way to get a hold of me is through text. You can text 305-930-7346 for the fastest response, but if you prefer to email, you can send that to podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. That's a dedicated email address just for the show. If you like this show, you can show your support by posting about it on social media and tagging me. Text the link to a couple of friends that may also enjoy it and subscribe and leave a five-star review if you feel like I've earned it. The website is TomRollandPodcast.com, and that is where everything lives. All past shows, you can go and listen to any show. You can look up all the different shows that we've done, both the How To Tuesdays, the Full Links, and the Physical Fridays. They all live on TomRollandPodcast.com, and the social media is Tom underscore Roland, R-O-W-L-A-N-D, on Instagram, or you can go to our big account, saltwater underscore experience. I hope to hear from you soon. So now let's get on to today's show. This is Carissa Gervasi and Dr. Jennifer Rehage, and this is the Tom Rowland Podcast. How, how are you? Is everybody doing well? Yeah. Fantastic. Great. I'm really looking forward to connecting again because the first podcast that we did, I found fascinating. I love the Jack Crevel. It's, it truly is one of my very favorite fish and you're doing this study. And so when I reconnected with you recently, you had some really interesting and exciting things that you wanted to, to fill us in on. So I'm super excited to hear about your study and what you found out thus far and where you are. So fill me in. Yeah, so kind of to recap, this whole Jack Herval project started because fishing guides in the Florida Keys were really concerned about their populations. They were seeing lower catch rates, um, and so they asked if we could kind of you know figure out what was going on. Um, and we have we've been working for a couple of years now on this project, and we have tagged a bunch of fish with acoustic tags. Basically, they can we can track the fish as they move through the water. Um, and really interesting results we had recently was some fish that we tagged in the Florida Keys moved all the way to Louisiana. Wow. Um, so that's that's really cool. We had no idea that they moved that far. Um, so we're getting a, a really great picture on what their distribution is, what their range is, and that's going to help us figure out how best to manage them. Okay. Before we get into the um, the, the the way that they they're moving and what you're learning about that, so you tag these fish with an acoustic tag. So in order to um, just so I, so I'm understanding and everybody else is understanding. Is there, is there something in the water? Like I know that there's another kind of tag where there's something in the water and if they swim near it, it pings that spot, right? Okay. So mm -hmm. is that, is there a grid of that, those things all the way set up all around the, the coast? Is that what we're looking at here? 
So yeah. it, it, <laughs> well, there's a there's a lot of them for sure. Okay. But that's yeah. already set up and that wasn't part of this study. So if you tag a Jack Crevel or any fish and it swims wherever there is is one of these pre existing things, you're getting that data. Yeah. It's okay. basically an underwater microphone. And different people along the Gulf of Mexico and along the coast of Florida, both the East Coast and the West Coast, have them for different studies. There are people that are studying sea turtles, uh, rays, sharks, lots of shark studies, uh, sturgeon in the Gulf area. And this is uh, the one um, where we get detections from Louisiana. It was a colleagues that work on tarpon. Oh, okay. Uh, so they have a tarpon array. And once you have uh, a tag in the belly of an animal, the tags are lasting more. Technology has gotten better. So they, ta- you know, the last can, they can last five to 10 years. So this is really good. You can get lo- lots of really good data. And then um, people are putting these arrays more and more to study different animals. And then all the tags can hear, can be heard, I should say, by all this hydrophones that people are putting in. Uh, throughout the Gulf of Mexico and throughout the Keys. And we have a network of scientists that we exchange data. So we had colleagues and we send, Carissa sent them like, hey, uh, here's my list of tags. You might see, you know, hopeful. Maybe like, maybe there are 25 colleagues or so that we reached out in the Gulf of Mexico, you think? Yeah, and we have these these big networks. There's a couple, the FACT network and the ITAG network. Um, They're basically just these groups of scientists that have these receivers in the water, and we all work together to share the data. So if somebody picks up somebody else's tag, they know it. So it's it's really great kind of collaborative effort. Hmm. And so people call them orphans, you know, orphan tags. You don't know. You picked up an orphan in your array. You have a tag number. And you have no idea what it is. So you upload it to the system and it tells you and it matches it up with the owner, which is really oh, cool. Oh, that's awesome. Man, the internet. What would we do without right? the internet? Like that, that's 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 amazing. I mean, because before that, you know, you would probably I don't know, if you were doing manual manual, that this probably would have slipped through the cracks, right? Like there would yeah, you wouldn't have any idea. You're like, Well, that's some other tag. We have no idea. It could be a sea turtle, it could be whatever. But we have no idea. Yeah, exactly. So do we depend on that, you know, like takes a lot of scientists with all people individual projects um to um to get those data to get those information and put it together so and jags are a great example like we had no idea where they would go right, right? how far they would go so we just like sending the tags out there and put uploading these tags in these networks and I'm hoping for the best that's awesome so if you were to you know when you first started this would you have ever in your wildest dreams thought maybe we should send this, these tag information to Louisiana? I mean, is that, was that even in the realm of possibility of what you thought might happen or? So, so, so we actually started seeing some detections up in like the Tampa area. So these fish were moving North from the Florida Keys and we were like, you know, I wonder how far they're going to go. And then we actually got a detection up in the Apalachicola area and so then that then we started thinking oh maybe these guys are you know moving either even further into the gulf of mexico so we started just reaching out to a lot of researchers in there just to see um because yeah we really had no idea we knew from talking to anglers that these jack Reval, they're fast they're powerful they have the potential to probably swim pretty far but we really had no idea just how far. Well, it's super interesting. I mean, to me as as a as a fisherman, that when I hear that, I think, well, that kind of makes sense on a lot of levels because there are certain times of the year where we see bigger fish. There's certain times of the year where mm-hmm. you see more your more plentiful smaller fish, and you just kind of wonder what's going on. Like, were they always there, or or maybe not? And as a fisherman, you're kind of like, well, I wonder why I can't catch those at this other time of the year. Well, right. maybe, maybe they're just not there. Like that's, yeah. that's what's really cool about this, this type of information is maybe you're not as bad a fisherman as you thought you were. <laughs> like, maybe, you know, yeah. maybe, maybe they just weren't there. They really weren't there. Um, right. How, how does this information strike you as an angler? Did you, well, did you have it's, it's not really a surprise that, that a fish like a Jack Crevel could swim great distances. But what mm-hmm. is a surprise is that they would, swim that direction, I guess. I, I don't know. I would think that that 
you know, it would it would certainly not surprise me to see, you know, a fish that was caught in the Marquesas, maybe then it's, you know, recaught in Sugarloaf or something like that, uh, you know, maybe 50 miles away, but a, a, a complete change like to Louisiana right. is very interesting. And so I wonder if you could give us a little bit more information on this particular uh, data, like what time of the year it was it was first captured and then what time of the year it was recaptured or, or heard in uh, Louisiana. Yeah. So, so far we have had three fish from the Florida Keys that got detected in Louisiana. And it was all of the detections were between August and October hmm. of 2021. Um, so it seems like they are heading up into the, those Northern regions more in the summer or fall months. Um, and we do see that they, they tend to hang out in more Southern Florida Keys areas in the winter spring, which is pretty much aligns with what fishermen have told us. You know, they tend to see the bigger jacker in the keys in the winter months. So we're still trying to, we're still collecting more data and we're going to run some analyses to look at, you know, the exact seasonality. So we can try to piece together when during the year these fish are in different areas. But as of now, it seems like it might be a seasonal north-south migration. So they're kind of in the cooler northern waters in the summertime. Right. And what, and do we have, do we know those three fish, when were they caught in the, in the keys? Um, so the two of them were tagged in 2019 and one was tagged in 2020, all in March. Um, so, so it took, you, so it took about a year or two keys, right? for them to get detected. Yeah. In the lower keys. Um, yes. one was in marathon and two were in the lower keys. Wow. That's super cool. And do, when you tag those fish, are you, um, do you always get like a measurement on them? And mm -hmm. some sort of description of the fish. So are these fish of the same kind of age class, size class? What, what do we know about the three fish? Yeah. So one of them that was tagged in the low in marathon, um, was about 12 pounds when it was tagged. So that was a pretty, a, good one. a pretty big one. Mm -hmm. Um, and that one was a, a fish that kind of hung around Louisiana from, August to October, 2021, but he was tagged in 2020. So it did take about a year or so for it to get up to the keys. And then the two other fish were tagged in 2019 and they were only about five to six pounds. Hmm. So it sort of seems it's still preliminary. It's only three fish, but it kind of seems like they reach a certain size or age before they start engaging in these kind of longer migrations. I wonder what I'm really excited about is if, it, as you continue this study, if you start to get some pings on the East coast, like if they, if mm -hmm. they, if they go up both ways, or if there is a, a real migration path, right? Like that's, that would be, cause that's what I think about the tarpon and, yeah. and so many other fish is like, they, they go up both sides of Florida yeah. and some end up in Maine and some end up in Texas. And, yeah. um, but which ones and why and how that's, that's the mystery. Um, yeah. do we know so who caught these fish cool. who tagged them? So most of the fish, I actually went out with some fishing guides, um, from the Florida Keys and to tag most of these fish. So but we had some very gracious Florida Keys fishing guides who were willing to take me out on the boat with them uh, for a few days to get these fish tags. Um, so quite a, quite a few people uh, to thank for that. We really couldn't have done this huge effort without the help of a lot of the Lower Keys uh, Guides Association and the Florida Keys Fishing Guides Association members. That's fantastic. And do they make, make you reel them all in? Because that would, it turns into work it t very quickly. Yeah, they turns made, into work. They made me work for it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's what the Jack Cravel is, is, is loved and hated for is that they fight too hard. Like <laughs> it's what, it's everything you want in a game fish, but then just a little bit too much, kind of like an amberjack. And then people are like, Oh, I don't want to do that anymore. Let's move on. <laughs> So That's as scientists, awesome. what do you, what do you make of, of this? When, when you see like 
I mean, you, you've had done so many different studies and when you see preliminary data coming in of like three fish and you've tagged hundreds of fish or thousands of fish, I don't know what you've tagged or, or if you can compare this to other studies, but when you see preliminary data coming in like this, I know you don't want to jump to any conclusions and you want to be patient on, on what you think, but how have you seen something like this kind of materialize and do you think like with all the tags that you have out there, what is the likelihood that we're going to start to see other pings? Like, what what do you think about that? Where are we with that? I, well, you know, I think it's it's just it's amazing to me. In fact, Carissa and I had a had a bet, so she owes me a bottle of tequila because I said <laughs> there's going to be connectivity, and she said, "No, I think Florida Jacks are Florida Jacks, and the Mississippi, Alabama, Texas Jacks are separate." And we had a bet and she liked it. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of tequila do you like? <laughs> very, very good tequila. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, maybe not grad students like that tequila. <laughs> yes, we, we have to wait until Carissa graduates and gets yeah. a real job. <laughs> okay. Um, but, you know, it it's just, it's just an amazing, it just makes you, it takes you back a little bit because you're just amazed about what we continuously learn from like we think we know so and then you get a finding like this and you're like wow those fish are amazing um and wow is this just like another how wonderful are these jacks i mean like what how amazing are they that and the ones we tagged it's that one that was a little bit larger but these are small jacks you know the five to seven pounders mm -hmm. are making all these movements um and we're just stunned by their by their connectivity, their ability. Um, you know, we know that a lot of fish move big distances and we have these migratory patterns. But at the same time, it's like, wow, jacks are part of that cool boys, you know, <laughs> the cool kids yeah. <laughs> with these large migrations. And we didn't think that was the case um, when we started. We know there was seasonality on when, and, you know, when we catch jacks in the Keys, we know that maybe they were coming in with the mullet runs in November right? Following those as the waters cool down. And we know that some of them disappear in May, but we know some of them are hanging out with tarpon. So it's hard to know, you know, what could they be doing? And uh, I don't think that we expected these large scale movements. We thought there might be some smaller scale connectivity that they would be connected up and down the keys like you described. Um, but even the ones that were tagged in the East Coast have wrapped all the way around the keys Mm -hmm. And show, showed up um, on the way to on the way northbound on the way on Tampa, right, Carissa? Okay. Those that are um, that have been um, tagged on the east side. So far, I think we have detections as far as to Cuesta on the east coast for those fish. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Maybe um, up the east coast, Jupiter Inlet. Maybe we have detections from there. But I think you know, just it sets you back, and it's just it's just like a it brings you back to thinking like a kid, like. Damn, these jacks are cool. Mm. Um, well, all fish. Just, I mean, there's probably the so many other fish that we we know very little about. We think we know a lot about, but when you actually, you know, it's kind of like the 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 great white shark um, tagging that has been going on with Chris Fisher and and O Search mm -hmm. and all of that. And it's mm -hmm. it's like people would see a big shark and they would say, "Man, I, I don't know what it was. A, it, it it just it was a huge shark." And now because you see the tracking paths and, and, and they come through these different areas. You're like, well, that was, that was a great white. Or you really, you get a video and it's clearly a great white. And it's not a surprise because you have this scientific study and this, and, and the, the, the technology has improved so much that you can see a breadcrumb trail of everywhere that this yeah. shark has gone. And, yeah. and, and the Jack Cravels are just one of many fish. I mean, there's probably, um, lots of members of the jack family i would think yellow jacks maybe i, I don't yeah. know there there in the last few years we've had a a complete explosion of yellow jacks bigger yellow jacks numbers of yellow jacks have never been uh in my career they've never been more than in the last few years i mean they're we're, we're finding them everywhere yeah and so when i see that i just kind of wonder like is there just a big hatch of these things or yeah are they, did they push in from somewhere else? And if so, why did they do that? And yeah. it's just so, so interesting. Um, no, yellow jacks is another one that we know so little about. Nobody's really studied them. Um, so that would be another great species to like do some tracking to see what's their patterns, but you're right, right. Their numbers are really abundant. And I don't remember seeing schools this big and everywhere. 
yeah. um, as we see today. And I don't know, ooh, it looks like maybe we lost Carissa connectivity. Um, um, but I don't, yeah, I don't remember seeing that, that years ago. Um, and it's really nice. I, you know, this, our climate is changing. Our temperatures are changing. So fish distributions are where fish are, you know, um, we keep hearing, for instance, about snook, they're expanding their distribution and they're going northbound mm. um, and they keep moving. Um, so we're going to be seeing some of it could be that distributions due to climate change. Um, currents are changing. So we might be seeing some big changes in where fish are in the coming years. So it's going to surprise us a little bit, too. Yeah. Um and what about, um, and we might need to wait for Carissa to, to get back, <clears throat> but what about the um, the pinging of these fish? Like if, if there were, I don't know, she said she had tagged hundreds of jacks probably. Um, I think the number is about 88, okay, so maybe 85. Less, so right around 100. And, and yeah. ha- have we uh, learned anything about the, the movements within, you know, the Florida Keys and closer to where they were first captured? Are there enough, like this grid that we have, how extensive is it? Is it enough to, um, Hey, you're back. Uh, is it enough to kind of, uh, monitor their, their patterns every five, 10 miles, or is it how- It's super dependent? Yeah. It's a really good question. So it's super dependent. That's where researchers there are, because a lot of these are individual studies that, you know, there might be a, you know, there's a, for instance, there's an array at the mouth of the Suwannee for studying sturgeon and snook now that are there. Um, so, and then there's Tampa Bay, which is a redfish uh, uh, array that was put in by redfish scientists. So you're dependent on the, you know, on what's out there based on what people are studying and their interests and their, the scale of those studies. So it's not as systematic as you're describing. It's not a grid. It'd be mm-hmm. amazing to have a grid, yeah. um, but we don't have that. So the mouth of certain rivers are good coverage. And then we have places where there's a gap. For instance, if you look at Big Ben in Florida and we go north of the Suwannee, it, you have to get to Apalachicola for the next set of receivers. So there's a big area there that we don't have a lot of coverage because there's nobody studying those rivers. And this infrastructure is expensive to put on the water and to maintain. Um, so it takes a little bit. We're dependent on, on, on that infrastructure from other scientists and the questions they're asking and what they're studying, which is may not be tailored for jacks. It may not be, you know, if we had a wand and we could do um, our perfect array, it would be totally different from what's out there because we're dependent on, on that, on those other scientists. Having said that, it's, it's really super lucky because um, it's kind of like, if you can imagine the way I think about it is like having a, a dark room, if you could imagine, and you have a flashlight and you have a bunch of flashlights that are, you know, pointing at something and illuminating something. And that's one receiver that's hearing for fish in those locations. Some of them are quite random, you right. know, and you're trying to make sense of where the fish is going by, you know, getting hit by a flashlight and it gets seen. And in our case, it was only a hundred tags. The probability of them getting picked up by, you know, the fish could have died, could have gotten eaten by a shark, could have been fished. We, in fact, we got, uh, Carissa got a tag from a, a young angler that sent us a tag. Maybe he was 11 or so, Carissa. Yeah, um, it was really cute. I got a phone call from a little boy who had found one of my fish and we have our phone number on an external tag and they told us where he could, where they caught it and everything. It was cute. And so he he killed the fish and kept it. Yeah, but yeah, they actually they dissected the fish for me and they took the acoustic tag out and mailed it back to me. So oh, cool! So <laughs> that was really nice. So the 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 way that these fish are tagged, it there there is a uh, a, a visible tag hanging out of the fish. Yes. So I put, so the acoustic tag is, it looks just like a little double A battery. Okay. It's a little cylinder and that gets surgically implanted in the body cavity. So it's just a very small incision. We pop the tag in and we suture the fish back up, but we also put a little external tag that just gets stuck into the dorsal muscle tissue. Um, and it has, uh, it's just a little thin rod that has like our phone number on it. Um, that says like, if you catch this, please call so people can recognize it. Yeah. Okay. Release me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of what I guess we should cover. If, if someone were to uh, recapture one of these fish, I mean, that's obviously you would want to hear about it, right? Mm-hmm. So they need to get the tag number, take a picture of the tag or whatever, and then, then call and, and mm-hmm. hopefully they're going to release the fish 
as well. Yeah, in this case, I think the fish was foul hooked, so um, mm-hmm. they didn't intend to kill it, but it just it, it died on them. So well, that so was they found if, a, if an eleven year old foul hooked a, a twelve pound jack, it was the it was a highlight of his year. I promise you, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> he, he had a great He's forever. He had a great time. Yeah, he. he I know. We just need a little scientist. I think. Yeah, probably, <laughs> probably. That's that's super interesting. Now, um, do we know like? On this, where the where these fish were heard in Louisiana, do you know anything about the water depth? About was it right at the Mississippi River? Like, what are we looking at there? Do you know? Um, so depth, um, I'm not sure, but there were basically, you know, how Louisiana kind of comes out, and the very tip yeah. of the state um, is where the Mississippi River runs out, right in um, and they have an array on mm-hmm. either side of the Mississippi River, right there, and that's pretty much where our fish were caught. So on both really? sides of the river. Um, wow, that mm-hmm. is one of the fishiest areas in the world. Um, yeah. as I mean, I'm probably mm-hmm. not telling you anything, but, uh, I went there with my friend, Anthony Randazzo and just to, mm-hmm. just from a fisherman's perspective, we went there right after hurricane Katrina. We were one of the first film crews in there and it was really torn up. But my friend, Anthony, who has a lodge there, he was like, listen, the fishing is as good as it's ever been. You need to come here. And so we put in, in the Mississippi river, probably not very far away from this, this array. And we were going to go look for trout. And he's, he says, look at the, look at the bottom machine right now. What do you see? And I said, well, it looks like it's 20 feet deep. And he said, yeah, it's 30 feet deep. And there was a solid mass of trout (laughs) 10 feet deep huddled no together way. as close as possible and he goes watch this we'll run across you know several hundred yards stop and it'll be the same thing and then we'll run up the river a little bit and stop and it'll be the same thing there the 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 quantity of fish that has to be like the the that array has to ping more fish than anywhere in the world. It's, it's, am- yeah. it's an amazing place that how the Mississippi river flows out like that. But I've, I've never seen, you know, and I can only see it through electronics, but I've never, we were dropping bare jig heads. And every time that, I mean, there wasn't even a bait on the, on the jig head, not even a plastic, but not even a bucktail, nothing, just a bare jig. Yeah. And we were getting a bite every single time. <laughs> it's awesome. And, um, <laughs> it, it's just a, it's just an incredible, that's when I realized, like, I'd always heard that the Mississippi river is a fish factory, like maybe no other in the world, but that particular area where it flows into the, into the Gulf of Mexico, right there at Venice is, it, it is unbelievable there. And, um, and so it's it's no that surprise that so that's productive. what they got. Yeah. Yeah. And so we know, you know, there's other species that are making that those migrations, right? Wrapping around Florida, like cobia and a number of species and targeting, probably targeting this, you know, this very rich, um, productive area out of the Gulf, you know, out of the center of the Gulf of the Mississippi um, drainage. And there's no, this is, you know, this, these movements that we're detecting by jacks makes us think the jacks are also tapping into the productivity, right? There's so much prey and so much food in that area that um, it pays for certain species to have these migratory patterns that encompass that production there at the best, you know, most productive time of this time of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, in the in the summer, you know, to try to capture that summer production because they're a much more annual system than we are, where we have productivity all year round or the lower productivity. But there, there, you know, summer production, you get all this recruitment and all these baby shrimp and baby fish that come out of those marshes, right? Um, and you're catching that productivity, and then that inshore offshore migration of the food. And there's no reason now to think that um, jacks are just going to tap into that productivity as well coming out of the Gulf. Right. I wonder why a Jack would ever leave that like, right. <laughs> you yeah. know, like to travel all the way up there and then to be surrounded by food everywhere. Yeah. And it's a Jack's job to eat it. Um, and they're really good at it. Why would they turn around and come back to the keys? And I guess that's what we'll determine in the next we'll couple figure of it years. Out. Yeah. It could be temperature driven. The cost of being, you know, in that productivity that the productivity is seasonal. Um, so it could be that it doesn't pay to stay and temperatures are colder and you be, it becomes a lot more comfortable for their metabolism to make those migrations like other species do into wintering grounds uh, and track the temperature, even though it might be less productivity, but um, that might be more, 
a thing to do, or it could be spawning. Mm, yeah. Right. It right. It could be spawning movements where because of currents, because of productivity, it might make more sense to spawn in Florida. And we're seeing the, that those migrations uh, into Florida in, in the time, you know, for spawning, for spawning reasons, and then back out to catch the productivity. That's super interesting. Now, the in, another uh, kind of mystery to me is like they would, these fish that we know about that, that left the Keys, they're leaving the Keys right before the mullet migration in the Keys, like where, where we're going to start to see much more mullet, much more bait fish, and they're leaving that, you know, to travel a thousand miles and, and end up in, in probably a more productive area. But it seems like it would be a lot easier just to stay just to capture, stay where you yeah. are, you know, and, and wait for these mullet to come in. But there's going to be so many things to, to be learned, but there's just so many unknowns. Like, is, is, it, is it interesting to you as a scientist, like, when you, when you learn one thing, it, it kind of helps you in a way, but then it also... Like to me, it brings up so many other questions. Like, why would they leave? They're leaving at a really productive time, and where are they going? And why would they, when they get up there, why would they leave there? Like, I don't know. Do you think about those kind of things? Obviously, you do. I'm sure. <laughs> There's always more questions that we get that get brought up anytime we get new data. So, I mean, that's it. That's why we still have jobs, right? That's why still, Jen's still working because she think, <laughs> keeps thinking of more questions to wet, work on more things to try to figure out. Um, but the cool thing about this telemetry data is uh, like Jen mentioned, these tags last five years and they've been out. Most of them have been out since 2019, 2020. So they still have a, a few years left that we can track these individuals. And we tagged over 80 fish. Um, throughout South Florida. Um, and we put some of those tags we put out in Louisiana and in Alabama. And so we're still continuing to get that detection data and we're just going to keep learning more and more about them. That's super cool. How much does, uh, does one of these tags cost? Um, last time I checked one tag was $330. Really? So they're, they're not super cheap, but they are getting less expensive as the technology continues to get better. It's becoming more and more accessible. So hopefully that'll get cheaper and easier in the future. Are they like phones where they also get smaller and smaller and smaller? Yes. (laughs) Really? That's and they that's, last longer and longer. Well, the fish are going to be yeah. happy about that. They have to. Yeah. They, they only have to have a small thing inserted into them <laughs> instead of something yeah, much bigger. Yeah, I think when we started, they were you know they if you got them a year long, it was you know amazing. And now we're getting almost to the decade of data. Um, and I, some of these species are very long lived. Um, the oldest jack on record is twenty, right, Carissa? Mm-hmm. Nineteen twenty. So. We could, you know, capture their movement for half their life. How cool is that? Wow. With that some of is, these tags. That is incredible. And Carissa, when you when you left, I was asking uh Jen about the uh the array and 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 if we had been able to to ping get some pings in the keys of the fish that you've caught. Do you have data on that? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, my internet keeps dropping yeah, out. It's okay. But uh, yeah, so we've seen quite a bit of movements throughout the Keys, fish moving from the you know, Key West up into the Northern Keys and back again. Um, so we have seen a lot of movements throughout the entire Keys as well as these movements north. So that's definitely something we're going to look into. Uh, we can run some analyses on these data to figure out kind of hot spots of activity where these fish are spending the most of their time. Um, and then we can try to figure out, you know, is that related to environmental variables like temperature or habitat type, things like that. And we can kind of piece together more information about what these fish are doing and why. Mm-hmm. And is the, is the, uh, is the plan and the budget does the budget allow for more tagging all the time? Is that, is that where we're going or, or are we sticking with a hundred fish? <laughs> well, Carissa's <laughs> about to graduate. She has to get her, she has a real job at Noah waiting for her. <laughs> really? Congratulations. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> what will you be doing? Like, like oh, that's, that's kind of interesting to me. Like you, this is, this prepares you for what, like all the work that you've been doing on the, with the, with the fisheries lab, 
Is mm-hmm. this, did this prepare you for your dream job or, or like, what, what does this prepare you for? What will you be doing? Yeah, it's really exciting. So I have an opportunity to work as a postdoctoral associate at the NOAA Fisheries Lab in Key Biscayne, Florida. It's the Southeast Fishery Science Center. Um, and the project that uh, they are working on there is working very closely with recreational fishermen um, on a red snapper project. Oh. Red snapper is a really big hot topic yeah, in the is. Gulf of Mexico right <laughs> now. Yeah. So we're doing a lot of cool research. And I think that the work that I've been doing with um, stakeholders, with anglers in the Florida Keys and with all this telemetry work has kind of helped me, you know, become a good candidate for that type of research. Because as scientists, you know, we tend to do a lot of our sciencey work, um, but we're starting to realize that communication with the people on the water every day is super important. And it's going to become a bigger part, I think, of fishery science in general is having these conversations and including the fishermen in, you know, management. Mm -hmm. So when, and you're probably not either allowed to or comfortable with this, but if what what kind of information do we need to get to see the red snapper be opened <laughs> as a i mean that's the that's no what com- that's the question that everybody has I and mean, you can say no comment or whatever i know that you Wait. you probably can't answer that question but maybe you could just in a hypothetical thing of 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 any other species that is currently protected what steps have to be taken to see an opening like we were just recently we just had a a, a the Goliath grouper was one. Goliath that, grouper. Yes. Yeah. So let's talk yes, about yes. that. Like what, like <laughs> that now we're to a point to where there is this proposal and maybe, maybe you, you can explain it better than me, but there's a proposal. I don't know if it's an actual thing yet, but mm-hmm. where you could buy a tag and, and kill a Goliath grouper one per yeah. year or whatever. So let's just take that. If that's something that's, that's real and, and what steps had to be taken to get to that point. And then maybe you could apply it to what might need to happen for the red snapper. I can go first on the Goliath. So, um, you know, s- Lots of our fisheries are in really, really bad shape, right? And Goliath is is one of them that's been, you know, on the brink of extinction. And it's very, 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 very slowly coming back. Uh, we have this proposal for harvest, a limited number of tags, right? 200 tags that would perhaps come into fruition um, later in 2022, maybe at the beginning of 2022, and the proposal is pending some consideration. Um, and this is an FWC proposal. And some of those tags would be taken within Everglades National Park. And then um, the other ones would be statewide with a, with a fee. And this is a hot topic because none of the scientists believe the Goliath grouper is at a place where we should harvest. Hmm. <laughs> none of them. Um, and that's based FWC? on that's yeah, based the on numbers. what just the numbers do these people yeah, ever go numbers. fishing yeah have they ever been so to we a wreck? Have, <laughs> yeah <laughs> based on just, the, the, just the, the data <laughs> yeah the data comes from multiple places but yeah um the the expert guides excuse me the expert divers at the wrecks the divers that know those fisheries quite well say there's just not enough goliath coming back and the numbers in fact have been higher in the recent years than have come down in these and they also have concerning data about how these goliaths are getting caught multiple times and they're seeing you know the, the, these you know obviously these expert um divers know these reefs really really well they know each goliath very very well and their expert opinion is that we do not have they're not seeing any recovery the numbers on the the counts from um uh, also from, from dive counts also do not show any high numbers. The incidental catch in, in bycatch, that would also be an indicator that they would be caught in bycatch, not showing high numbers. What we do see is we're getting more juveniles, mm. which is great, but getting more juveniles in places that we're seeing this, you know, finally with this rebounding of juveniles, that's been really low uh, in 2010 since haven't seen juveniles and they got hit really, really hard. And then they got hit really, really hard by red tide. So we have more juveniles, but more juveniles 
does not mean population recovery. Right. <laughs> it's like saying baby deer means let's go hunting for deer. You know, it's great we have baby deer, but that doesn't mean we should open hunting season, right? We need to see these guys enter the adult population and a really massive entry into the adult population that we can see, wow, there's Goliaths in a lot of places where they should be. They haven't been there and now they're back. And those adults are recruiting to those reefs. Um, but I would say, um, and certainly I'm not a Goliath expert. Where I, I've called the Goliath expert. It's going on. And they say, no, no way. This is no way a good thing to do. There to support recovery. We do have more juveniles for sure. And that's a really great indication that things are going in the right direction. But most folks think it's premature to open up for harvest. Mm -hmm. The harvest is for juveniles. Um, so the regulations that you saw, the proposal for the 200 tags is going to be juveniles in the 20 to 36 inch, right? So it's going to target those juveniles, um, which probably doesn't set to satisfy those people that want to harvest them. So it's sort of like, why are we doing that? Right. So I understand all that, but it, it seems like to me that, you know, just from observation, there are way more red snappers than there are Goliath groupers. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so, um, I mean, the red snapper like and, and not just in the Florida Keys, like everywhere that that I go fishing. You go to Louisiana, they're everywhere. You go to Georgia, they're everywhere. There 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 are a lot, but yet it remains, you know, pretty tightly closed. So my question is like, um, is it just based on science and does that go state by state? Or do do like if Georgia is having like a boom in, in red snapper, does that have any bearing on what Florida does or like where, where, who is the, is the governing body or what steps need to be taken? Uh, if, if a species is doing very well, like you don't even have to say it's the red snapper, but just, you got a species mm -hmm. that's closed or very heavily restricted. And what does it take to see that open? And you did a good job of, of talking about the Goliath and that, you know, I understand like you, you're seeing a lot more juveniles, but are, are those actually making it to adulthood yet to be determined, right? We're seeing adult red snappers for sure, like lots of them. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know. It seems like they would be a, a, a species that might open. Chris, are you still going to get hired? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I can, I can say a, a few things on it. So to kind of clarify the way that red snapper is managed we have state waters and then we have federal waters, mm -hmm. right? So in state waters, which is usually out to like nine miles, depending on the state, this the individual state has jurisdiction and they can basically choose to do whatever they want. Usually they're given like a quota that they have to abide by, but they can try to reach that quota however they choose to. And then out in federal waters, um, that's, you know, the federal government dictates, uh, the, the management dictates what the catch limits are and what the restrictions are. Um, so it's, it gets complicated with a species like red snapper because they, you know, they, they expand all of these different regions. And so if people are fishing for them a lot in one state, um, they might have repercussions on the adjacent state. Um, and so trying to figure out how to manage when, you know, states want to do whatever they want to do, but then mm -hmm. the federal government has kind of oversight a little bit, it gets really complicated and it gets really political. And I think that's a lot of the issue right now with red snappers. So, you know, we have the science on the one hand that can tell us certain things about how the population's doing. And, but then we have all this kind of politics on the other side, and it's a lot of balancing that, you know, people at NOAA do, for instance, do, and the state management does, um, trying to figure out what's best for the fish populations, but also what's best for the fishermen. Right. So it's really complicated. <laughs> yeah. Super complicated. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I, I can imagine, I mean, everything that you said, you know, I, I understand all that. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. It seems like a very complicated issue on all fronts. Like you have, might have one state that really is advocating for opening because their financial uh, uh, benefits to that state. And then the other one is saying, no, I, you know, we don't have enough law enforcement to take care of, of 
you know, checking all these limits if we open this up. I don't know. I mean, there's all yeah. kinds of things that a lot of people don't consider when they when they say, you know, they're there's I'm looking at a hundred red snappers here. I don't know why I can't keep one. Um, right, mm-hmm. right, right. There's lots of other things that are, that go into that decision. This makes me think of you know the same thing with mahi mahi, right? We want to we're seeing big declines in the quality of the mahi mahi fishery in Florida, and there's concerns, and we. Anglers are and um, captains are asking for a little bit more regulation for Florida, right? To protect our, you know, our our fishery, and but then it's it's a multi-state fishery and it's a Caribbean wide fishery. In fact, the connectivity is still kind of not certain um, all the way down to the Caribbean, with even to connectivity to the and, and with the Gulf as well. And Car- North Carolina, for instance, they want to take their quota. They don't want any restrictions. Um, so now we have Florida anglers asking for more. Um, more protection and smaller limits in Florida willing to do that in North Carolina saying no way. Hmm. And then the federal, it's a federally managed species. So the federal, the feds are like, mm, what do we do? You're right. It's a, con- you know, we have to come to an agreement. We could have more restrictive uh, as, as Carissa was describing uh, policies within state waters in Florida, but that would do very little, right. Because most of our, our, do- our dolphin are caught in federal waters. So it's, it's really tricky. And then, you know, as, also, as these fish are moving, you know, you have a you have a quota that's regional, but then the quota could be filled up in Florida. Right. So by the time right. the fish get to North Carolina and they're moving up Nobody can keep a few them. months later, the quota is filled up. Um, so it makes it really hard to manage. It's a huge challenge to do that at, across multiple jurisdictions with anglers that want to catch fish and. And on top of that, the timing on when fish show up is changing. Mm-hmm. So the migration patterns are changing to climate with climate change. So that's another uh, wrinkle on, on the management side that what we think is when fish show up and how our quotas that are set up may be changing because the patterns of migration are changing with as things get warmer and our currents change. Yeah. Recently, um, one of the fish that has, has shown a real difference, a, a change, let's say, um, and it could be, it could be a coincidence. It could not be, but the triple tail in the Florida mm. Keys, there was a change in the, in the limit size. And within a year or two, there were way, way, way more fish. Mm-hmm. And it's very interesting to me to, to see that. And at first you can just clearly, it's clear as day. You can point your finger. Oh, well the, you change the size limit. Now there's more fish. This is way better for fishermen. It's yeah. way better for everybody. And let's do that across the board. But you know, when you take, when you look back at a, at a much bigger picture, you're like, well, it, it seems like that's the obvious thing that happened, but could it have been, you know, a, a hurricane that brought in a bunch of these or, yeah. or could there be other factors that did? And I'm all for, you know, uh, whatever we need to do to go out there and catch more and bigger fish. That's super great. And these triple tail that are around, they are bigger and they're dumb nice. and they're fun yeah. to catch. And there's lots of targets everywhere and it makes for a great day of fishing all for that. But it's it's difficult to to really be able to confidently put your finger on, yes, that's what did it. It seems like that's what did it, but there could be way other, way more factors. Yeah. A lot of times we're not tracking these fisheries close enough, right? Like with jacks, we have very little information. So if you were, let's say we get regulation for jacks and they start coming back and we're seeing more bigger jacks back in the flats, you know, behind rays and the kind of thing we'd like to see back with us, like 10, 15 pounders coming back. Um, we don't have a lot, a lot of understanding of, you know, we have a little bit of information before we implement these policies. So it's hard to disentangle the policy effect from something else that could have been a fortuitous effect, you know, of the population. Mm -hmm. Um, so we need, you know, if we're tracking them, we can tell right away, but sometimes you cannot tell, but for instance, but we, in certain cases, like you just know, those policies are working. I can think of Barracuda as an example, right? We put Barracuda limitations and we were seeing so few in the flats and they came back, right? As soon as we put those limitations and now we, we have Barracuda numbers up in the keys. That's another one that I would think it's, you know, very closely, you know, clear response to the management and to um, having those, you know, those more stricter or, you know, management policies. So I would think Jacks would respond really well. Um, 
as far as we can tell, they're overfished, which means if we can restrict the harvest with commercially, you know, and recreationally, then we should see a positive response. Mm. Um, because what's limiting their numbers is the fact that we're taking too many. The minute the minute we stop, you know, taking too many, and there's no other limitation on on what's happening with the species, we should see them right bounce back. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. It seems like, um, as far as the Jack Cravel is concerned, that if 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 there is an issue with taking too many, it would probably be in a commercial operation because most most uh, recreational fishermen, I mean, not all certainly, but m- most release the Jack Cravel. I think it doesn't have a reputation as a as a fish like a yeah. snapper or a grouper or like you don't catch one of those and go, man, I'm keeping that one. Like that's it's it's and it may be good to eat. Who knows? I don't know. I've never eaten one because it has a <laughs> reputation that it's yeah. not particularly good to eat, what which is good for the jack, right? That's good for the survivability of of any fish. But at one point they th- the the bluefin tuna had that had that yeah. uh uh reputation that it wasn't good to eat. And then all of a sudden, every, it's the most valuable fish in the ocean, you know, because yeah, right. I don't know, it, people learned how to eat sushi or I don't know what it was, but it, it, that reputation turned around and now yeah. bluefin tuna is a, is a, uh, is a delicacy where Jack Cravel is not considered a delicacy. So are there operations or, or do they harvest jacks in nets or in big operations where, you know, for protein sources for fish oil, for cat food, for dog food, for whatever. Is that, is that one of the, the, um, uh, uh, challenges for that fish? So as far as we can tell, the commercial fishery really isn't that big for Creval Jack, at least in Florida. It's typically um, mullet fishermen who tend to kind of encounter Creval Jack schools and will harvest them opportunistically. But actually, you'd be surprised the recreational fishery actually does catch quite quite a bit. And I know they catch them. Did they kill yeah, them they too? Yeah, they catch and yeah. keep them. Okay. Yeah, so there there are a large proportion are released, but there are still quite a few that are landed, brought back to docks. And we can see that in the NOAA dockside survey data. Um, we have what's called the MRIP, is the Marine Recreational Information Program. It's a survey that NOAA has been doing for many years, um, dockside with recreational anglers, um, just tallying up catches. And we've seen... Uh, a pretty big increase in catch rates of Kerval Jack um, since 1980 um, until now. Um, and so that it's it's having an effect. And I've actually spoke to a few fishermen in the Keys who say, yeah, you know, there's some people I know, especially some locals maybe who do catch and keep Kerval Jack to eat. Some people uh, like to eat them. So it's it might not be everybody, but there, there might be just they're, enough. They're probably think- great. They, they're probably yeah. great. There's um, also some keeping for shark bait, you know? Yeah, yeah for sure. That's happening. Um, and so I think if you look at those numbers, Carissa, was it 30%? Um, maybe the latest numbers is 30% or 70% of release, I want to say, from those numbers statewide, if you look on average. So yeah, it's about 70 to 80% are released. Release, yeah. Which if you look at Snook, Snook is 99% released. So that's a big difference. You know, you would think 80% is quite high, but still for some other fisheries, you know, you're releasing, there's a lot more releases. Snook are 99% release. Yeah. 99.5. See yeah. What, now, now to me, as soon as I hear that, that that's actually surprising to me. Um, yeah. Because 99% of the people that I know release the snook, but those are mostly fishing guides and they understand what's going on and, and they, want to protect their fishery and it's become a release fish, but I didn't know that only 0.5% of all anglers are releasing their, or, or keeping their snook. Yeah. Um, and there's a, a little season. higher on the there's East a, coast. You know, there's a season obviously too, Yeah, um, which, which keeps a lot from, from being uh, caught and killed. But um, that is a, that is a um, uh, more of a campaign of education really. Yeah, I think. that's right. 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 Yeah, we've that, seen that, it. If you and you look at the number over 30 years, you've seen that number come come down from, you know, maybe 30 percent or maybe I want to say, uh, you know, like a percentage where, you know, every every other snook is being kept yeah, and released. For sure. And you see over 30 years. And that's a that's an amazing change in our fishing culture. Right. Of anglers that 
that care about snook that are committed to snook. I have my snook back there. Yeah, I see it. <laughs> um, and that's an amazing culture of, you know, the transformation to a catch and release mostly. Uh, at the same time, we have a ton of fish landed. You know, I think that the latest estimates I saw, it's maybe 8 million, 8 million fish are landed. So even if you, you know, if it's 1% or less, point, you know, half a percentage point, it's a lot of fish, right. That are being, cause we have so much fishing pressure and so many fish being landed, um, in the state, but yeah, it's a wonderful thing to see. Right. And all our, um, how much people care and that culture that we have for snook and how much, you know, snook English are special. They're just kind of really care about snook. It's sure. a special fishery. Oh, absolutely. I would say, it's, you know? a, it's an incredible fish and, and the people that, that fish for them, uh, also, Probably, you know, I don't know what kind of data we have on snook uh, movement, but that doesn't seem to be a fish to me that that would move to, you know, great, great links. You would think that like you could do great damage on a snook population or certain a snook spot if you killed a fish every time that you went there. Then yeah, all of a sudden, sure. it's not going to be a spot anymore. There's, they're, they're, they're used. We used to catch them there, but we don't catch them there anymore. Well, yeah. that's because you killed them all, and that's yeah, where they exactly. lived. <laughs> you know, and and it, I think that that is, um, it's a real bright spot because the snook is considered one of the best uh, tasting fish in the ocean. It has that reputation, and if you go other Amazing. places, um. It, it, they they do keep and kill the snook and you can even see mm-hmm. them in restaurants like I saw them in Costa Rica we we had snook at the restaurant I was surprised to see it on the menu but it was it was on there and so that fish has the reputation of being a very very good table fish but ninety nine percent of people release so that is a cultural thing where that is a cultural thing yeah that we've done over time. Um, you know, it's just uh, long term, and we and we know some wonderful scientists. In particular, I'm thinking of one person who's now in his 80s, but he was an FWC snook scientist, and he worked very closely with Florida sportsmen to create these campaigns about how to hold snook and releasing snook. Um, very close and very productive. You know, tapping into that the attachment that people have to with snook, right, and that mm-hmm. special relationship that snook ha- snook anglers have with the fishery, and educating people, right. Making it, um, making that science known and then kind of like bringing the fishery along in this path of more and more release, right. Becoming a almost fully catch and release where people, you know, we all know people that keep one or two snook a year during the season. Uh, but then largely a successful catch and release fishery, which Mm -hmm. is, it's great to see. Certainly if that can happen with a snook, it could happen with a Jack Cravel if this type of information gets out or, or certain, certain type of information gets out that it is super important to, to release these fish because, you know, I don't, I don't know. We don't know yet. Like what, what are we going to learn in the next couple of years and, and their movements and, and why it would be so important. Um, maybe there aren't. You know, the Jack Cravel to me is a fish that it seems like there's just an infinite amount of. But maybe as we start to learn more about the Jack Cravel, it's like, you know, certain times of the year, there's a lot of them around, but that's all of them. And then they move, you know, I don't know. It's it's just right. interesting. And that's why I think that that more information and more knowledge coming from science is super important and and has so much of an impact on on the the fishery as a whole so applaud what you've done so far with the with the jack cravel it's great work and uh super interesting to someone that sees them quite regularly and uh realize that 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 fish that you just caught might swim to louisiana i mean that's that's truly awesome and amazing so, yeah, thank you so much. We appreciate it. You know, Jack is a, uh, it's, I, we, we have some Jack lovers out there, but you know, a lot of people don't appreciate Jacks or, mm-hmm. you know, um, certainly our guides appreciate their value as a, you know, as a great trip saver, you know, when things, you know, when things are, when conditions are tough and other things are not pain, you know, sort of working out on the flats and we go after Jacks and we can reliably find them and they can, have people can have a great time or customers can have a great time and people visiting Florida can really have a great time in our fisheries. And that's something that Jack's do for us day in, day out. (laughs) Absolutely. There has never been a, there's never been a day saver as good as a Jack Cravel or a school um, of Jack Cravel, even better. 
Um, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just coming at you with those big giant heads. I love yeah, it. <laughs> or sitting in a channel where you can just catch one after another on a jig. It's, yeah. uh, it's super fun. And lots of days when it's blowing 25 have been saved with, with four or five Jack Cravel. And for that reason alone, right. uh, to me, they're, they're worth, they're worth, uh, their weight in gold, uh, maybe mm-hmm. even more so than bonefish, uh, or, or tarpon. Like th- the, when you really need it, these are the ones that 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 save the day and, and yeah, keep a, checks keep to your a, bodies. Yeah, and they keep they keep a fishing guide in business. So I'm all for protecting them however we need to. I want to keep in touch with you and and see how uh, see all this information that we we might gain. And Carissa, you're going to be at NOAA. So now we're going to have to have a NOAA podcast if they let you do that. I don't know. I think they keep you pretty tight lipped uh, on certain things. Um, but, yeah, we'll see what I'm allowed to say. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, best of luck to you. And thank you for um, explaining the the Red Snapper to the to the level that you're allowed to. I understand what's going on there. But um, yeah. So thanks, Jen. Thank you very much. No and problem. You're going to trim the uh, part on the Goliath out, right? You're going to cut it out and just blank. <laughs> do, you, do you want that trimmed out? I think, I think, uh, I think it was fantastic. <laughs> I'm just waiting for some phone calls. I'm like, what are you saying? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll let you listen to it if you want and, and you can tell me whether it needs to go out or not. We, we super appreciate your interest in Jack. So it's yeah. awesome. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, sorry for the, the, the miscommunication on scheduling, but I'm glad we got it done. And thanks so much for your time. I'll let you know when this comes out and uh, have a great day. All right, thanks, Tom. You.